and welcome to the Real Stuff Podcast. This morning we have with us my co-host Courtney and we have a guest host in Katisha of the Katisha Bud Buzz YouTube channel. And our very special guest this morning is Dr. Dion Curling. And she will be speaking to us about mental health in black women. I think it's a really amazing, amazing topic, amazing field to be, to be dealing with. So I'm going to ask Dr. Curlin to tell us a little bit about herself and then we'll move into the meat of the matter. Okay, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. Um, say about myself, I live here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You know, um, <laughs> I'm um, I, right at the moment now. I'm becoming a psychologist. I'm a, a therapist in mental health, and I focus mainly on Black women's mental health. But I see everybody. Uh, I um, I worked at a community health center for almost twenty years, putting their program together and seeing um, Black women and women of color. And now I'm in private practice and working on getting my. Um, licensing to become a psychologist. Uh, you can ask me more questions later if you want more to know. <laughs> I don't know what you want to know. <laughs> uh, well, well, you have, well, to, you have to get a license to become a, a psychologist? I yes, thought you were just training. You need to get a license here in Ontario. So you need to have your doctorate degree so, um, in psychology. See, and then we have the College of Psychologists. Um, and then you have to get, you have to write an exam and you have to go through um, an oral exam and then they'll give you a license to practice in Ontario. Okay, oh. make, sure, make sure you can do what you say you can. <laughs> yeah, yes. And you're not yes. Messing up, up with people's minds, you know. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> did, you, did you invite up some people? Yes, I invited two people, okay. two of my sisters, Nicole. Curly is my sister and Rojean, yes, she's there coming on art. They're listening. I'm seeing a Denise too. Oh, yes, and another friend, Denise. Are they able to come on? Is that okay? They are. Yeah, man, yes. they're in. They're in, they're they're in, in they are in the room. Okay, yeah, great. They're, they're in the room. Great. So if they want to participate, they could tell you about mental health as well, too. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, Roy, it's the here. biggest topic right now. Yeah, and they're Especially. black women. And you know what we do? We meet every Saturday, which I think is so good for black women, so we can just talk. And that's what's important. Okay. And to be listened and heard. So we'll talk more about that later. Okay, <laughs> that, is, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Yes. Because up to a week ago, I heard somebody speaking about that something must be done about the police force, you know? as mm. relates to their mental health. And you know, every and then there there was an argument also about street people, people who, who lives on the street, their mental state, you know, their mental state. And the last one that is coming up now is the children. People are speaking so that we they need to do something very, very serious about the the mental health of our, our children now. Yeah. Because COVID has taken a very, very serious, serious toll on us over, over the time. Yeah, exactly. Is you want to come in, Courtney? No, no go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, just give me a few more minutes. Um, working okay. Up from, yeah. Okay, so go. The, the floor is yours, Dr. Curling. The, the floor is yours. Floor is me, mine. Oh. How, how would you like me to start? Thing. Well, I mean, tell us probably what what mental health really is and why the emphasis on black women. Well, I see mental health personally, especially for black women, is a political statement. Thing. Um, we black women, <clears throat> when we look at uh, how we navigate ourselves in the world, we're not at the forefront. We're not even considered. 
we're not even at the tables of decisions that are being made in society. Okay. And we are can be easily forgotten. So I think what's important is when we talk about, and then that does something to our mental well-being. That does something to how we value ourselves and how others value us. If we're not even at the table of making decisions that make that impact our lives and our children's lives, right? Therefore, we're invisible, and then we become invisible. So, and we don't see our importance. So that's why I say when we decide to say, you know what? My voice is important. My thoughts are important. It's therefore mental health is a political act that when someone can listen to us, when we can say, you know, I'm going to take care of myself. Take care of myself by uh, getting your nails done, let's say. Take care of myself by getting sleep so I can have to be in the right framework to help the children that's going to be the next generation. If we don't do that, then what's going to happen to the next generation? Okay. So when we start saying, you know what, I need to be heard, I need to be listened to, and even just process things. So if it's going to a therapist, it's great to get that support and breaking that stigma about mental health. Or even like I say that I have my, my girls on Saturday, we get together and that they're like, we're therapists to each other. We talk about what happened in the day and we're heard and supported. That's what mental health is about. Mental health has been around, or therapy has been around from the beginning of time when we just sit around and tell stories. Our ancestors did that. And so you support each other. And so it, it happens in the churches. You know, it happens in the communities. And so mental health is important. And when the COVID, when they start saying, be alone, isolate, that did, I don't even realize, I understand we have to keep ourselves physically healthy. But that impacted a lot of people's mental well-being. <clears throat> that you'll see people on the streets think even even more unable to pay for their homes and even just me being out to run to connect with other people. People are taking alcohol. It's crazy. I don't know how it is where you're at in Jamaica, and I believe you're in the states, Courtney. Maybe? Yes, I am. Yeah. So everything was locked down. But when I went to uh, to the store, the liquor store, the lineup was long. They won't, they couldn't even afford to shut up the liquor store because they knew that would take it to another level. But it was long and because people are soothing mentally, um, self-medicating themselves to alcohol in order to cope through the COVID, to the isolation. So when, especially us as black people, we're community people. And so for us to be on our own, it does something to our mental health, our well-being. And so I think it's so important that that's my take about mental health. Black women. But ask me questions or thoughts. Okay, Dr. Carlin. No, um, I mean, uh, go ahead, Flavis. No, you're going. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Dr. Carlin, I, I was just wondering why, you know, women, because, you know, to me, in my mind, women are more resilient than men. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we become know, resilient? Because we need each other. <laughs> and, we, you know, mm -hmm. and so, so, you know, you know, I was just checking that you said, you know, you're specializing, you know, in dealing with um, the mental health of black women. But I'm saying that the black man has gone through these experiences too, like, you know, like where you at and, and in the States that, you know, as black people we all face racism and, and things, you know, that left us, you know, all are left us behind, you know, economically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, we're facing the same problems. I know that because a woman may, you know, well, it is known that women are more emotional then, so mm -hmm. to speak. But I, I, I am looking at from the angle that, you know, women are more resilient. And they absorb things, you know, much better than men do. 
thank you for bringing that up because that brings up a lot of things why I do black women. I see all everybody, but why I think black women is so important because we get lost in that frame of reference. When we look at, let's say, let's, let's focus on racism, right? And the, let's say the black power movement. We, women were there supporting and we, yes, the color of my skin, I identify as black or I'm a black, and I look at black women, but we get lost because the issue of black becomes forefront, but my gender is not even there in, in the discussion. Just the color of my skin. So part of me is left outside of the meeting. Then you go to the feminist movement and they're all around the table talking about we need equal rights for women. So that my blackness is outside the table, outside yeah. the room. So those, yeah. those two meetings are happening, right? I'm not there. I'm not at that table because the intersecting of my blackness and my womanness is not there. And that's what I really, intersectionality like Kimberly Crenshaw in the States, she talks about that, how we black women get lost in black feminist thought because we thought, yeah, but what about the black movement? Okay, yes, we're there. But then when you guys get all, get it, the changes in the rules, well, <clears throat> the, maybe the men will move up, the black men will move up, because of the blackness, but not women. We don't get the same equal pay because of we're female. Then we go into the movement for the, you know, feminists, which is all white women. And they get all get their equal pay, but then all oh, we're black. So we get lost. And then we say, well, they're good because they're resilient. They're strong. Really, we're almost like the mules of society. We yeah. gotta hold everybody, it's she okay. She does, all right. So she should be giving and taking care of us because she's good, but she's not good. She knows how to put the lipstick on, put the nails on. And because we've taught from our grandmothers and great mothers, you better have your face when you show up. But inside, we're broken. And we can't even say to ourselves, I'm tired. You know, I would like to get a hug sometimes too. I like to not be resilient all the time. Mm -hmm. I understand, understand that, yeah. How, how do you think that COVID has impacted what has really been bad for Black women? Well, one thing is that I feel like has impacted, but we have to be creative, is that the isolation, we need other people. People in general, I don't care what um, nationality are, human beings need other people. If you have a newborn baby, okay, and you feed them and you uh, do that, but you don't hold them, comfort them, okay? You say, oh, they're good, but not good. Their immune system goes down because we need, we're tactile people. Yeah. yeah. That wholeness and that but when you say uh uh be six feet apart and there's many people that might or they say in your family sometimes my family is just me one you know and so the isolation okay okay i can do it for a week i can do it for two weeks we're going two years say and now we're even scared to be with each other the isolation the anxiety comes up oh my gosh oh my gosh you know I, my mask went, um, went down my no down here I might get COVID or I might give it to, I might kill grandma. That constant anxiety does impact us, you know. So therefore, you know, I, we have to know how to manage it and be creative. Like this is a beautiful platform now. We can talk to each other, right? And I think some, what we, my group did on the Saturday, we get together every Saturday and we just talk on Zoom or on the telephone just to connect and say, you had a rough week? Yeah, me too. You know, that wasn't cool. I know what you mean. Oh, you got to win. That's great. So COVID made us more separate that we don't get together physically, but at least we can be creative and try to get together in another way. 
and we got to, and that, I feel that is political. Sometimes I'm too tired. I can't be bothered to meet with the girls on Saturday on the Zoom. But if I don't, you realize it's going to impact me later. And then it impacts my family. Because when I'm not in a good place, my family's not in a good place. And COVID has made it very challenging in that, in that sense. So we have to find a ways of how we can connect with one another. Some people are saying, no. Yeah, COVID is, I mean, people are saying now that when COVID leaves or goes down or whatever, it's going Oh, sorry, Flavis, I can't hear you. Is it going? Uh, is yeah, internet not... Uh, so much before COVID. Oh, can you repeat that again for me? Sorry. Yes. No, I'm saying, people are saying that when COVID finally goes away, it's going to be very difficult for us to get back together. To the closeness. How do you see that? I, I agree because we have to deal with the anxiety that it has caused. Because people are scared to connect. I don't want, because the messaging is that if you get too close, I could kill you. <laughs> All right. And so we got to be careful how I get the cl get close to that, close to you. Okay. It might seem extreme, but that those type of things are happening. So we have to just slowly integrate. But I think it will come back. It will come because we're naturally beings of that want to connect and with other human beings. So I think also too, we just need to be patient and kind to us um, through the through this period of COVID and after COVID. And let kids be kids and play with kids. You know that the. Let the guys play dominoes. That that's mental health right there. You know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The lazy thing. when that's gone, like jeez. Then he comes home miserable. <laughs> and I have to go take care of his misery. <laughs> you know? Okay, Dr. Carlin. I want to invite before you go ahead, Courtney. Before you go ahead, Courtney. I just want to invite everyone else in the room that they can chip in whenever they want to. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, okay. Yes, Dr. Curlin, um, just can you just um, talk about the role that religion and spirituality plays in in a person's um, psychological well-being? Thanks for that question. I love that question because um, I, for me personally, I would define myself as a spiritual person. Okay. And religious person, but more spiritual person, because when I get a client, let's say, and I, you know, you come to therapy, and you talk, you ask them very a lot of questions to find out, like, who is this person? And personally, when they say that they attend church or they have a spiritual, um, you know, understanding or wanting to be a, they're a part of a group for that, I said, oh they're gonna be okay, they'll get through, because it helps my work too. It helps to support them through difficult times. And I think lots of times in counseling, and really therapy is very Eurocentric, but we need to be able to, it needs to be more flexible and bring in other people who have been doing counseling from the beginning, like I said, like the churches. And to work with the churches, to work with um, spirituality, you know, that can really help. I think that has been almost for a lot of people, been the their base, their support. You know, when they said they were going to close down the churches, there, I thought, oh boy, they the they won't shut the liquor store, but they'll shut the churches. And that's like the other lifeline for a lot of people. So I feel that, church, no, not for everybody, but I feel that churches can play a really, or do play a really big, huge role in people's mental well being. Yes, yeah, so. Um... Just another quick question. So what other methods do you employ um, during your therapy? 
other methods? Uh, the method that I usually employ, you mean for when it comes to religion and spirituality or yes. overall? Oh, overall, the, overall, overall. Well, overall, my approach is what I call, which is very popular now, called cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? It's CBT, and a lot of people are using that right now. And, and I was kind of hesitant, but I find that it's very helpful. And what that means is what we... It, our thoughts, what we think, influences how we feel and influences what we do, not what is happening out there. Because something could happen, right? And you can tell two people, and it happened in front of two people, and they both see it. Someone robbed this person in front of us. Okay. And someone said, okay, Courtney, what happened? And you'll say, oh, the guy, um, I don't know, bumped into the woman and he, he fell and he, uh, her purse went, fell and he, he picked it up. And, and then you can say, and, you know, he was trying to help her out. I think that was really great. Let's just say, you know, I feel like he was a good guy. And then I'm going to really congratulate the guy what he did. So it's like what, how you saw that situation goes into how you think about it how you feel and what you do. I might say that guy went up and punched the woman out, grabbed the, um, the purse and took off. And I'm gonna go to the police and tell them whatever, right? So I might see it, I might tell myself something totally different about what just happened. And that might brought so much anger to me, right? And then me and influence what I do. If we want to change what's happening, we're going to have to change our perspective. When we change our perspective, it can change how we feel, and then it can inform what we do. Okay? So that is a whole little a process. And the, working with the therapist to say, oh, so that's interesting, because sometimes I always ask clients, you know, so what did you think about that? And they will tell me things that just blow my mind. I thought, I never thought of it like that. No. And then I get into their psyche, how they're thinking about it. Like, oh, that's what's causing the pain. Me, is there a way you can maybe just shift a little bit of thinking of that? Maybe that's what's creating the problem. And when you're able to shift a little bit of how you're seeing, open up the possibilities, it kind of creates more, give you more, um, let's say resilience or more options. Now, I don't know if that is clear or if confusing, Hmm. Hmm. In Jamaica, we have a lot of single period homes, mm -hmm. mostly women. What would you say to them? Well, that's, to that's cope. The how to cope. Well, that's really yeah. difficult because every person, like I say, have a different perspective. Right? So it's like some single parent women may say thank god he's not around because he would give me more headache like the the father <laughs> to say you know <laughs> i want to do what i do and i'm free and it's what i say goes so they might see it that way and person say you know he doesn't even help me at all i everybody has a different perspective you know and this is all on me and it's i'm exhausted how can i manage so it's like not one rule is best for every single person. Yeah. So I would say to that person, let's just say a single parent um, mother, would say, what makes you well? Okay. Because what makes you well will make the children well. Okay. And so to figure out what that is, okay. because how I say, my healing is not my own. When I'm feeling good and when I'm taking care of myself, when I'm healing, it heals others. It's not a selfish act. It's a very unselfish act. Mm -hmm. So I would say for that person is to take care of themselves so they can be able to take care of, the, of others, their children, let's say. Mm -hmm.
face-to-face schooling so the kids or the children are at home because there's no school okay How can these parents deal with that uh that is tough because me personally like here we i think believe in ontario and canada we in ontario they have the option so now in jamaica everybody is online is that what's happening okay oh i can't uh, hear yeah, I think um, there's some internet problems. But um, what is really happening in Jamaica most of the time is it depends on the level of, of COVID. You know, what percentage of the population is being infected. Or, so, you know, so there, there's a time when it's all face to face, but some of the kids don't have the equipment. Yeah. There's not much internet. And you know, like the parent, if they... oh, yeah. yeah, I guess the internet is not doing too well. Yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. There's a fluctuation in the internet. So, yeah. uh -huh. so. Uh -huh. mm. Okay, uh, so Dr. Curlin, yes, as I was saying, um, you know, the face-to-face, -face, well, problems are that, you know, sometimes is it's like the family may only have one phone, the mm -hmm. mom can't leave her phone at home with the child, yeah, or, or with the children. So, you know, there's so there's a problem, you know, and sometimes the internet is not available. Mm -hmm. them are into the here and that they are and so you know there's not much going on in that era so as i said you know like things like that can create a lot of anxiety of course yeah so you know that's what in the jamaican school but i think there's an effort to try to have more in class sessions but they, I think they are doing some kind of rotation right presently. It's not full scale or old scale right now. Right, yes. And that is really, I, I can't imagine how challenging that must be, you know, in having the kids home. Like, and we have to think of like, I look at my privilege being here in Ontario, you know, um, they can choose to go in or not we have i have internet you know and the phone and so that's that's a privilege that a lot of people don't have so when you think about it in jamaica that's why i say that we can't come in and say do this and this will work because there's so many different factors when it comes to our health and and how people's lives are you know you're looking at you know economics that plays an impact um uh, the structure of uh, what's happening in the country plays an impact and that all plays an impact on our mental health and like how you're saying the anxiety must be really high but i don't know it, we one thing i find and i i notice this a lot with black women black men and everybody the, we are so hard on ourselves but we have to give ourselves some grace we're doing the best we can with what we have. Yeah. It is not like how it was before. And sometimes we can say, you know, this is the best I can. And be gentle and kind to yourself, supporting the kids through this and realizing that their mental health too is like they're only kids. They have feelings too. Their anxiety is extremely high. And to give them grace and say, you know, and realizing, you know, they're doing the best they can with what they have. And maybe they're, who knows, say they're acting out, is because they're scared and scared, being scared is the anxiety, the stress, like, 
what is this? There's no, and a lot of times people can't, the elder, the adults can't even give them answers. When is this going to be over? There's no like that safety adults can give anymore. So the, of course, anxiety is high. So I think at the end of the day is ease up. Be, um, it's a difficult time. Be kind to yourselves. And I think it's a, like, how do you do that? A lot of kind of, they don't know how to do that. They don't know, it hasn't been modeled. We always say, keep working hard, we keep working hard. Yes, but I always say to my kids, we work hard, but we play hard too. There needs to be a nice balance. You need, you need the hugs up and the kisses. And also you need to say, okay, you guys sit down and do the work. Right. Yes, and you know, while we're speaking about the children and school, it, I, I think, you know, how would you address the prob um, this problem? Because you see this, I, I think ch children learn more, you know, by listening to their peers answering questions more, you know, than more than a teacher. So, are, you know, when they sit in groups with their, their peers and talk about, you know, the specific subject. So, you know, that social interaction process helps in learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I, I, I think now that a whole lot of children, you know, are going through trauma mm -hmm. because of, you know, that lack of interaction and, you know, what you would say, tactility to, you know, like that kind of closeness where they hug one another and play with one another a certain, you know, mm -hmm. a certain way. So how do you address that? Or what, what kind of advice would you give to a parent, you know, seeing that this kind of interaction is lacking? I know it, it, it is so hard because I understand how I'm seeing the parent. I'm a parent and I'm exhausted and I'm tired, you know, especially with this COVID and I understand parents are, are tired, okay? But like I said, if we could maybe somehow incorporate it in the family coming together, like if it's we can like, hug up together on the couch or on the bed and read a book together. Each person read a, a, a paragraph, something like that, let's say. Or we sing a song. Like sometimes, which my sister was on this call right now, <laughs> but there's different rhyming songs that make you remember different things. So we yes. have a different way of remembering all the provinces. So there's a song that you sing, you know? And I remember like we maybe if the kids, there's a skipping rope that you, you know, you, you, that, that's how we learn. That's how you can learn and make it fun and interesting, okay? Um, it's like, it really is like, sometimes kids are saying, why am I going to school for what? Because it's not practical. You can make education practical. Like, why do I need to know math? Is because when we, this is the amount of money we're having in and we need to buy the groceries. So maybe let them be a part of doing the math of getting um, how much can I spend on this and that and cap doing the calculations, okay? I think incorporating into the, the family structure that is, because sometimes kids don't work, okay, we're gonna, some kids do well, like, okay, we're gonna sit from this time to this time and do some work. And some kids do really well like that. Some kids need to say, okay, what's the point of this? And sometimes if you, I don't know if you have access to watching a movie and then after watching the movie, let's, let's dissect this movie. What was going on with that movie? Let's have a conversation about it. Okay. There's social science there. Okay. There could be something about hit, talking about history. So I, I would say is try to incorporate it. But also I still think that, yeah. and also to one thing, the big thing, okay, yeah. is sleep. We need to rest. <laughs> Sometimes like study, study the important, but when we're all so exhausted, we can't com compute anything. Parents get all angry and all upset. The kids are like, uh, anxiety is sky high. Sometimes we just need, sometimes we need, let's get to bed and let's go sleep and rest. Let's go for a walk. I'm a big believer. Let's go and get some fresh air, go for a walk come back. 
and this and have and one thing else too i agree think i'm a big believer having a routine getting up at a certain time making your bed i tell my son is that you make your bed that's how you're going to get smart that kind of discipline of just getting up making up the bed having a little bit of a go for a walk let's say then do a let's do something together some kind okay. and then going to bed at a certain time a structure a routine and i think that's a big thing that has been lost for it with covid yeah okay dr carlin before we close off i uh, i just like to ask this question about you know the cultural aspect of mental health because like you know, some of the stuff that you're talking about, you know, the hugs and the sing-alongs and thing. Um, the people in Jamaica, you know, they are not so socially conditioned to some of these things that you spoke about because of culture. So talk about that sociocultural aspect of mental health. Well, I feel like, tell you the truth, I don't, I don't know Jamaica because I'm Canadian, right? My parents are Jamaican. But I do believe that there are some parts of like they do have that sing along. They're like and Nancy's stories are huge. And I think we need to talk about that. Like to bring it back if that's not what they're talking to. But that's how we learn. That's how um we talk from way back. You know. Um uh, I remember my, my grandmother, she would give me the licks, but she would give me the hugs too. I knew she loved me. Um, I think it's even just to have a, we learn how to, to talk to each other. What ways can we talk to each other? You know, um, yeah, the under, that's why I say that I'm coming from this perspective. I can't go into Jamaica and say, I'm going to do mental health there because I don't know the, the culture, you know, the best that I can, but that's why it's to, one thing is to be able to hear and listen to one another, okay? So when, it's like God gave us all two ears and one mouth. And I think with the call, it's like for us to hear, what are the kids saying? What are the mothers saying? What are the fathers are saying? You know, if we start hearing each other, then culturally we could start understanding one another. Okay? And even in, in, in the homes. So I think also with, with the parents is going back, what was helpful for you? And sometimes kids, I find, really want to hear your story. How did you, how did you deal with this? And if you share, sharing those stories, we come from a culture of storytelling. I think it's to get back. Yeah. But I, I, I think who, who are, because, you know, there's a great shift in, in the culture right now. Mm. Because you know that, like, everything that happens in, in North America, you know, that's what is attracting the kids in Jamaica. Yeah. You know, so there, you know, I mean, you know, first time, like, when, when we were growing up in my time, you know, we made our own ties, you know, our skates, mm. our kites. Mm -hmm. We play marbles. These kids all they do is video games. Yeah. And you know what? And that's how it is here. And I can't take it. My son's always on the video game, but this is the world they live in. And I think it's something we have to stop as parents and say, okay, what's going on there? To have a conversation. Listen, maybe figure out what play a video game with them. See what's going what's happening. Because it's not the social media is not leaving. And I think our generation has to learn how do we adapt and then how do we speak their language? So it's to sit down and listen to their language. What, what sounds, I don't know, what the big, I don't know what the big thing is, if it's Instagram or TikTok, let's do a TikTok together. I know my friend, TikTok is huge. And you can use that for learning. So you can have these things, like I remember in my days, TV was a, the evil, but you can use that in a positive or a negative. You can limit it and then you can learn. There's so many things from the television I learned from Sesame Street. 
you know, I don't know, <laughs> electric company. So I think us as parents can say, oh, those are bad. Let's, let's hear from them. How can we use it? Maybe you make a TikTok, and I don't even know about TikTok. My good friend here, Denise, she knows about TikTok. <laughs> you know. Let's do a TikTok that um, they can learn something from it. Okay. So I think we need to embrace and learn how to get a nice balance. Because this is the culture where the, the kids are living in. Okay. Yeah. So I'm uh, just asking, um, do any of your friends want to add or make an input? I know Denise doing the same thing or Yvette. There's the two that there. I don't know if they want to. Yeah, yeah well, sure. invite them. You know, they I can, was... before we clo close out, because we're, we're closing out in a few minutes. Okay. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, go ahead. I was actually just putting a comment in the chat. Great job, Dion. Um, or Dr. Curling. Um, I actually use TikTok to engage with both of my kids. Um, I didn't realize uh, the sadness that my son was experiencing. Um, I saw him really withdraw during the pandemic. And I know, Dion, I know we spoke about this. He's a very gregarious and outgoing boy. And when they were um, sent home from school, he went inside himself and speaking from a Jamaican perspective uh, I was not raised with a lot of hugs and kisses and I recognized I needed to break out of that and I needed to meet him where he was at and comfort him I also recognized that he was pouring his heart out on social media and there were things that he was posting to show how lonely and how alone he felt um, so I started using TikTok to my advantage and um, engaging with him there and so now we text each other back and forth throughout the day and I do check-ins with him so I think you've hit the nail right on the head Dion um, that we need to meet them where they are wow thank you thank you very much Denise thank you um, this is Yvette if I I could just um, add a little bit because I think that um, what was said was great from both um, Denise and Dr. Curling. Um, it's it's a very it's a question that I wrestle with with my um, preteen um, with as well is um, he's also just into the video games, and as much as we try to limit it, I realize too how it's really his lifeline, especially now. Um, during COVID, this is how the kids talk to each other. And there have been times when he's been banned from it as a punishment. And I see how much that really affects him um, more than anything else. You know, he's not going to read, he can watch TV, but he's not interacting. This is how he is interacting with other kids his age. So it's really important for them now, especially during COVID when they can't meet each other. Um, I, I think it's, it, there is a kind of a mental health um, aspect to it as well. So that as much as we limit it, just realize too that it is very important to them. Um, and I don't, I don't like to cut it off too much because uh, this is what he needs. And he's told me this is also how he gets out his frustration in playing games. Some of the games I'm not really a fan of, but um, this is where he can let go of his, his anger and frustration. And it's, it's actually therapeutic for him. So a quick question, Yvette. Um, do you recommend uh, a given time for that? Because I, I've seen, I've watched uh, my nieces and nephews, you know, playing these games and, and you know, they'll be on it for, I mean, six hours, seven hours especially on a weekend mm -hmm. yes yeah. um i totally agree and that's that's often what uh we as parents have to um are constantly looking at and he gets it at this age he gets it um i know it might be a little bit more of a challenge with younger children um but at 13 he gets it we do we do limit his time we don't have a specific time, but we do limit his time. He's allowed to play a little bit more on the weekends for maybe a total of three hours, but broken up 
during the day, not three hours all at once, broken up during the day. But on the weekdays when he has school, he can play for an hour. And, you know, he can either rest or if he hasn't done his homework, then he plays after that. But he knows that, okay, after an hour, that's it. Um, no more for that time. And that seems to be okay. As long as he has some time, it seems to be enough for him. I think in anything, we need balance. Yeah. And especially with COVID and this time, we need to know that that's how we connect. And we need to, like here, connecting this way virtually, this is, this is what we're living in now. Hi, Denise, you have something? Yeah, actually, something that we have just recently implemented, um, getting my son to use his technology properly. So um, I've told him, if you want to have screen time, then you need to do 30 minutes of reading. You need to attend your extracurricular activities. So now he has set timers using the calendar on his phone. So it sets an alarm and lets him know, oh, it's my silent reading time. So I've got to turn off whatever I'm doing and go do that. And then furthermore, he has an, uh, an alarm set at 9.30 because we've told him that's your cutoff time for um, gaming. You've got to turn it off, hand in your phone and find something else to do. And that eliminates the back and forth between the two of us of saying it's time because he sets the alarm and he knows when the time is up. Mm, that's great. So, and final word, Dr. Curlin, as we're about to close. I think what I'm getting from this, and I hope everybody got something from it, but I think it's balance. I think we need to be kind to ourselves and our kids and really have balance in our life. And that is what mental health is all about and understanding that we need to connect. And if it's through video games, it's through um, Zoom, and hopefully we can do it in person, you know, we just need to work with where we're at and give ourselves grace and patience and kindness to this challenging, really challenging, challenging time. But thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak with you all. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Curlin. And thank your friend, thank your friends for us. Yvette, uh, De um, Denise. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I think there are others there, but that I don't know. Yeah. I haven't seen their names. Yeah, there's really people. Anyway, oh, thank you. Yes, I see Flavors is back. Um, so Flavors, over to you. Is he still there? Pictures there. Yeah. Flavors, are you hearing us? Okay, I uh, just on behalf of the Real Stuff podcast, I thank you again, Dr. Curling, for being here, taking time out to come and, and speak with us thank about you. mental health. Surely, I know that our listeners and viewers appreciate um, the work that you have done and what you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. with your client as a therapist. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you, and surely we'll have a part two because you know, it was a quite interesting show. So I see Flavius. So back to back to you, Flavius. Yeah, are you hear me now? Yes, clearly. Okay. Yes, I was saying that you know we thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you know you sharing this time with us and this information that our listeners need. Everybody needs this information now. And we are very, very grateful for you to be here and having you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed my time with you all and I really appreciate it. And I look forward to part two. Yeah, thank you. De definitely part two. Part two is a definite. Okay. <laughs> Take good care. Enjoy your day. Keep safe. And say, and say hello for me to the other Dr. Curling. I will. I'll tell him. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Sing you lead a song for love. You be love the way I was. I do go along. I go to say you lead a moi.
da sung pula li da mua li da sung pula well unfortunately this is it till next time bless That's why men do what set me a fickle flee Me I fi take away me sad Me I fi take away me sad Me I fi eye like a thief in the night Me I fi get all that side